professor in the Department of uh, Industrial and Systems Engineering at a and here. Uh, she actually uh, became an astronaut in 1990. Uh, and uh, she has uh, uh, been on four space shuttle missions. Uh, she has spent a thousand hours in space. That's like six weeks. <laughs> That's a long time. Uh, she uh, uh, following the Columbia tragedy in 2003. She was uh, 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 she was selected as uh, head of the uh, space shuttle program's uh, safety and missions assurance office. Uh, she is re a retired United States Army colonel and a master Army aviator. Uh, she's got many awards. Uh, she has the United States Presidential Rank of Meritorious Senior per Professional. Uh, she has twice won the, the National, uh, the NASA Exceptional Service of Medal. Uh, she uh, uh, is in the Hall of Fame of the Army Aviation Association of America and a lot more. I, mean, I, I can't spend the time to tell you everything she's been awarded medals of, but clearly she's extraordinary, and this is an extraordinary opportunity for you to listen to her and to actually be able to ask her some questions. And so, Nancy? Great. Thank you. All right. As, as the title says, I am now a professor here, so I learned one thing on the first day. All lectures start with the following. Howdy. Hi. All right, all right, so we've got some current, maybe past, and hopefully future Aggies in the crowd. It's a pleasure to be here. I spoke last year. This my first, uh, last year was my first year here at A&M, and first year at the Physics Festival. It's a wonderful opportunity uh, to engage in some educational experiences that are also fun and enlightening and engaging, and I hope the same for this lecture. Um, luckily, this didn't happen this time, I think, because there was a slight delay uh, getting the other group out. But on the first lecture, I was standing at the back of the room waiting to start, thought somewhat unassuming, though in my blue plate jacket. And a young man walked by me and said, we got to go listen to a speech for an hour? <laughs> and I said, and I, as he was passing me, I said, yeah, and I heard it's going to be really boring. <laughs> So you never know who's in, the, who's in the audience, who's in the crowd. That's one of the first things you learn as an astronaut. Everybody's watching all the time. Um, I have been extremely blessed to have been on the space shuttle four times, spent 1,000 hours in space on four different missions. In the morning, I spoke about my last mission, which was servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. And to change it up a little bit, in case some pe people came back for repeat performance, I'm going to talk about my third mission. The third mission was pretty spectacular we started the International Space Station. We just celebrated the 20th anniversary of this mission, went down to the Cape. It was awesome. Uh, the crew was all back together again, and they were showing videos from our flight, and we were all reliving uh, those moments again together. And I don't care how long we've been apart, uh, I, I describe it as, you know, they're my family. They're, they're my space family. Uh, because you train, uh, you all, you know, we know it's, uh, an inherently risky business. Uh, we become very close over the years and over the decades that we work together. And just like, uh, just like engineer, I tell my students, engineering is a team sport. You know, flying in space is the ultimate team sport because y the public gets to hear sometimes from us, but behind us is literally tens of thousands of people all over the world. We're just simply the ones that are entrusted, you know, put the equipment in our hands, but. We'd be nothing without those tens of thousands of folks at all levels throughout the agency and throughout international space agencies, literally across the world. So our mission actually started back in November of 1998 on an unmanned rocket. So this is a Russian proton rocket. So the first Russian element went up unmanned. And so here's a proton rocket over here. And then at the very top, underneath this black shroud, and if anybody knows Cyrillic, that is Zarya. Zarya is the Russian word for sunrise. So all modules were named in addition to their you know, engineering name, which was the functional cargo block. That's not a very interesting name. Uh, so we refer to it as Zarya. And it was launched out of Baikonur on November 20th of 1998. And we waited a long time. We trained for this mission for two and a half years. We experienced quite a few launch delays. Uh, because 
we had this element being built in Moscow at a factory uh, that was joint with the Boeing company, but it was in a Russian factory. And prior to that time, they built intercontinental ballistic missiles. And in fact, when we visited the factory, there were ICBMs still lining the walls of the factory. We weren't allowed to walk around, by the way. It's a good way to get in trouble very quickly. Um, and we got a chance to go out to Baikonur. And because we delayed so much, one of the crew members that was assigned to be the first expedition crew, Sergei Krikalov, was added to our flight uh, just a few months out. So Sergei Krikalov to this day is one of the most experienced astronauts, cosmonauts in the entire world. Certainly at that time he was. He actually runs their astronaut program now over in Russia. And, and working internationally, interculturally, is one of the really fun parts and interesting parts of being an astronaut these days because it's truly a multinational effort just like all of our future endeavor, endeavors in space will be. Uh, so we had delayed quite a few times and uh, CNN actually asked, hey, can we sit with you guys and watch the launch? Now the launch Houston time occurred about 2 o'clock in the morning Houston time and we, we knew that if this launch didn't go well, there went the space station, right? This, this was the first element, you know, the key piece. So we declined to have CNN watch our reaction just in case everything didn't go according to plan. Um, and so we only had the crew and our spouses and just one other person there that wasn't on the crew. And we're all pretty quiet and pretty intense watching the launch, uh, which thankfully all went according to plan. And when it was all said and done, the, the one person who was in the room who wasn't a crew member turned to us and said, well, you can't blame it on the Russians anymore. Now it's your, now it's your turn. Um, so in fact, uh, just a few weeks later, it was our turn. And we took up the first U.S. segment, which is the Node 1. This is in the cargo bay. Now you notice uh, they had to kind of shoehorn that thing in there. And in fact, when we got down to the Cape and we were training, the guys that had put that in the payload bay uh, said, hey, who's the robotic arm operator on this flight? And everybody pointed at me. And they called me aside and they said, it took us four days to get it in the payload bay. How in the world are you going to get it out of there in space? Very carefully. Um, and you'll see, that's what I did, very carefully. Uh, so launch morning is really spectacular. We are wearing these big pressure suits uh, that was added after the Challenger explosion. So we do have a way to get out of the vehicle. Pretty constrained, you have to be in control level flight below 30,000 feet. But uh, we have a way to parachute out, of, had a way to parachute out of the space shuttle. And so that's the purpose of those uh, pressure suits also in case we have a depressurization incident because we have lost uh, spacefaring crew members, in this case cosmonauts, due to depressurization during entry. Uh, the entire ensemble with the parachute weighs about 82 pounds. So you're looking at me saying, hmm, <laughs> substantial percentage of my weight, yes. Uh, so we try to stay in very good physical condition because you know, I was always cogn cognizant. I didn't have to just get myself out of the vehicle if something went wrong. I had to help one of my fellow crew members get out of the vehicle as well. So we launched uh, in the middle of the night. Now you would think that we trained for this mission two and a half years, that it might not be at breakfast when we had this conversation, but in fact, this is when we chose to have this conversation. While over breakfast, by the way, none of us eat breakfast, it's just kind of uh, for show, because the television cameras and, and others come in, and uh, just in case anybody gets space adaptation sickness the first day, usually nobody eats breakfast. Um, and so over this time, one of the crew members said, hey, has anybody launched at night before? Again, this was literally the night we were going to launch. And we all said no. And luckily he said the following. When you launch at night, it's going to appear like we're on fire. Because the plume from the main engine is going to wrap around the vehicle and it looks like we're flying in this fireball. It was really good he said that <laughs> because we had a loss of communication during ascent. And it did look like we were flying in a fireball. So had I not known about that, I might have thought our situation was a little more dire than just losing communications with the ground, which, by the way, <laughs> was a configuration issue on the ground by another astronaut. And he was making all the calls inside the room in Houston. So everybody thought things were, he thought he was communicating. We weren't answering because he wasn't talking to us. He was only talking to the room in Houston. But things like that occasionally happen. Um, all right, so what's a launch like? Um, hopefully the audio's up. So 
the way this works is um, you're sitting on 7 million pounds of thrust when you go out to the pad. Um, and a lot of times people ask, so what are you thinking about when you crawl in the vehicle? And honestly, from the time I poke my head through the hatch, nothing but business. Because if you know anything about human spaceflight, we've lost a crew on the pad. They weren't even supposed to launch that day, the Apollo 1 fire. We have lost a crew during ascent. Now up to this point, we hadn't lost a crew on entry, but every single phase of flight is risky. And so as a flight engineer on all four of my flights, nothing but business. Now, to get my prayers out of the way. In fact, they had to come find me because I was knelt down in prayer, to which they asked, do you pray every morning? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. I just pray a little bit longer on days like today. <laughs> um, so you'll see the main engines come up to power. Uh, that was to make sure that they, they were all functioning, T minus six seconds. So the vehicle's still on the pad. When those engines start firing, producing combined about 1.2 million pounds of thrust, and it's at the back end of the vehicle, sitting in the vertical. And it's held down on the pad. But that's a lot of thrust. So the vehicle actually goes through something called the twang. It would actually rotate forward. And then right when you were back up the vertical, hopefully, is when the uh, solid rocket boosters lit. You could see it out the overhead window. So you could see the twang. So be looking for that interesting feeling. Um, and then you leave town very rapidly. There we are, sitting on Endeavour, T minus six seconds, after the engines come up to life. back down to the water, divers would go retrieve them, tow them back into port, and they were actually reused uh, after refurbishment on future missions. Um, and then you get to orbit, and now you got to take that rocket ship and you got to transform it into a living and working platform for the next number of weeks that you're going to be there. So this is me at the robotic workstation, and you see even astronauts bring models with them Winter is no longer working, bring models with them to, uh, to refresh themselves where everything is. So there's my little model of Unity and the FGB here. Here's uh, monitors uh, that can display television cameras. There are television cameras in each of the four corners of the payload bay, and there is one each on the arm. There's one on the elbow and one on the wrist. That's how we grapple things, uh, and the one on the elbow is pretty good for an overall view. The way in which you fly the robotic arm, you have two hand controllers. You have a translational hand controller in your left hand, a rotational hand controller in your right hand. The translational hand controller gives you three degrees of freedom in what we call the X, Y, and Z. X is fore and aft. Uh, y is, is side to side, and Z is up and down. In the right hand, you've got a rotational hand controller, pitch, yaw, and roll. So you're combining all six degrees of freedom at the same time. My personal opinion, helicopter pilots from the Army make pretty good robotic arm operators. I think that's why I was picked. Um, because in a helicopter, of course, you have even more controls than that. Um, all right. So here I was on that day uh, extracting the node uh, with the arm. So there's a grapple fixture on the node here. And at the end of the arm, it's like a canister. Inside that canister are metal snares. You go down over a pin. You close the snares. They retract and rigidize, and now you can move the element around at the end of the arm. So you can move around a 25,000-pound payload at the end of this robotic manipulator. 
Uh, the boss was um, supervising my work here. That's the commander of the flight. He wasn't too far away, making sure I didn't make any mistakes. All right, so here's another video of, now, this is sped up, I believe, 20 times, which is kind of comical. But as I said, I was very, very careful getting out of the payload bay because I only had a half an inch of clearance on either side. Um, and in fact, they had to take some handrails off. We had to reinstall them on orbit. They took, and they used every bit of space. Uh-oh, that's not working right. Let me, let me rewind it, see if we can get any better performance. Hopefully it'll run better now. So you can see very, very minimal clearance there in the payload bay. Bring that up, and then this right here is the orbiter docking system. So we installed it on the docking system, and then there's a pressurized tunnel connected to the mid-deck of the shuttle. So we didn't have to go outside. We could go through the pressurized tunnel, turn that 90-degree corner, and then go up to the space station. But we couldn't do that until first we had to rendezvous with the FGB. So Zarya had been lost, uh, launched two weeks uh, before us. That's our first view of it out on the horizon. And then we manually flew the rendezvous. Now, rendezvous is pretty interesting because you're essentially flying formation on something at Mach 25, okay? 17,500 miles an hour, and you want to zero out your relative rate. So you don't want any rate in any direction to the extent that that's possible. Uh, that's the commander's job to manually fly it. So he did a great job. Unfortunately, um, I'm going to pause the video here for just a second. So here he is bringing it down. Everything looks good. And everything was good for a while. Uh, there was a requirement we had to grapple over a Russian ground site. And our timing was such that we got there just a little bit early. Not a bad thing, but we got there a little bit early. So for 15 minutes, we had to sit there with a poised in the end of the arm watching it. Flying formation on Mach 25, just a few feet from our windows. But they said, don't grapple till you get over the Russian ground site. And the reason why they did that is because the Russians wanted to make sure that their control system got turned off. Because if their control system on the FGB was on and the shuttle's control system was on, you got this force fight and it's, it's not a good situation when you got two different spacecraft trying to control. So they wanted to make sure it was supposed to, as we grappled, their control system would be turned off, but just in case, they wanted to be able to send the command. And so we termed that the longest 15 minutes of our life. And for 14 minutes, everything went well. But at 14 minutes, we hit a dead band on the control system in the shuttle. And what that means is it reached the limit of controllability and it fired a thruster. And then we were off to the races because now it was all aligned and no rates and just waiting to be grappled. And now all of a sudden, I had to zoom the camera out and heart rates went way up, I am certain. Uh, and we did get the situation back under control, but at one point the boss looked at me and said, that's all I can do, you got to do the rest. Uh, so it was a little bit exciting, but luckily uh, everything worked out. So that's the FTB coming down, and, and the way in which it's coming down, of course, is we're flying up to it. Now, the interesting thing is we put that node on the orbiter docking system, it blocked our views from the window. So the only views we had were from the cameras outside. We couldn't see anything. Um, so we used some computerized tools to get in the corridor. That corridor is like a cone, and the closer you get to rendezvous, the tighter your tolerances are. So you can see the arm all poised there, and that's probably the first 14 minutes where we're all just waiting. Um, I had flown uh, the orbiter, uh, done some of our initial rendezvous, and this is me going over the pin. Now, I've got 90 seconds to grapple it. After 90 seconds, orbital mechanics will take that spacecraft, because we're both in free drift, and it will start drifting towards the tail and then up and out of the reach of the arm. The arm's only 50 feet long, so I had to get it done in 90 seconds. Somebody asked me the next day after I did this in a press interview, were you nervous? And I said, of course I was nervous. You know, nothing like going to work and have about 4 million people looking over your shoulder making sure you don't mess this up, because if you did, we weren't going to have a space station. So guess what the headlines were the next day? Astronaut amidst being nervous before. <laughs> I have my own theory about maybe what one of my male crewmates might have said, but I was 
I was honest. Uh, I now was able to breathe. I will tell you that uh, when I transitioned from the front cockpit to the back cockpit, the pilot who was on his rookie mission looked at me and said, good luck, and extended his hand, and my hand was kind of like this. But from the time I put my hands on the controls, we were so well trained that, um, that all the nerves went away. That very last portion was done by firing the thrusters on, on the shuttle. Because it's a Russian docking system, it needed a certain rate of closure, and we couldn't impart that much force with the robotic arm. So in free space, 230 miles up, we had the FGB here, and we had the, docking, the, the node here at the end of the docking system, and our tolerance was plus or minus two inches and two degrees. And if we were any further away than that, we asked them one day, well, what would happen? And they said, well, this is the worst case scenario. You sure you want to hear it? I said, yeah, we want to hear it. Because we didn't have a direct view of that interface. And I'll talk about how we, how we gained some knowledge about whether we were in that, that very tight tolerance. But they said, okay, well, worst case is you're, you're outside the envelope for capture. You fire the jets on the shuttle. They bounce off of one another. And when the FGB goes away, it rips the arm off the shuttle. And so you can imagine all of us on the crew were sitting there like, and they said, but that's the worst case scenario. So we were definitely not ready for the worst case scenario. So very, very tight tolerances. On subsequent missions, they put in a center line camera, which would have been very helpful. But unfortunately, we did not have that. So that's what the FGB looked like. Uh, solar rays all extended. Um, talked about firing jets on the shuttle. So you can see one of the jet firings. And this is that fuel interacting with atomic oxygen. Almost looks like it's, it's burning off uh, some sections of the tail, but it's not. Um, and so once that FGB came down into the payload bay, we couldn't see because, of course, the, the node was there. So how did we do this? How did we get into that tighter tolerance? There was something called the space vision system. So if you look, there's all these white on black or black on white targets all over both elements. And so the way in which a photogrammetric system works is the cameras look out there, and they see an array of targets on one element. They see an array of another. And then it's just basic math and geometry to determine the offset between the two, not only in XYZ, but pitch y'all roll. Pretty simple, right? Should work, right? Well, guess what happens on orbit? So on orbit, you're orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes. So every 45 minutes, the sun comes up, and every 45 minutes, the sun sets. And so guess what happens to the lighting on orbit? You get a whole day of lighting, basically, you know, daylight time in 45 minutes. The lighting is constantly changing. It is the harshest glare you'll ever see, and it's the darkest night you'll ever see. And now you've got white on black and black on white targets. So guess what happens when a shadow comes across one of these black on white targets? The system goes, Nope, I can't tell black from white. And in the words of my late husband, it just portrayed a Ghostbuster symbol across <laughs> and not data. Um, so luckily, I had trained to use the camera on the elbow. That gave a pretty good view of this interface. It's a non-orthogonal view, so it's not really good to determine that tight of a tolerance. And as you move the arm, the camera is moving constantly. The perspective of the camera is moving constantly. Um, luckily, I had trained in our virtual reality lab and in simulators for a long, long time, and it, and it paid off. So once those two elements were mated, then it was time to do what we call extravehicular activity, spacewalks. So we had to go do three spacewalks, because you got a spacecraft built in Russia, you got a spacecraft built in the United States, and now you got to connect them together, right? You got to make all the electrical connections, the fluid connections, establish communication between the two. And I'll tell you, for a year or two when we trained, <clears throat> we never had a successful simulator session. Because you've got a computer system built and designed in Russia, computer system built and designed in the United States, and every time we never made it these two together here on Earth. We never had the communication systems actually talk to one another here on Earth. There was always an emulator of one system uh, in that loop, and it didn't work very well. So we weren't, quite frankly, very sure how well it was going to work in space. 
to the point where I actually told my husband, and, and this was my third flight, I told him I wasn't worried about launch. And I, I, I retracted those words because the first night we had a launch scrub at the, literally the last second. And uh, I was so concerned about our mission on orbit that I said, hey, we're well trained, the vehicle's safe, we're good. And then I had a healthy respect for Aston and Kim, which probably I should have had the entire time. But uh, so we did three spacewalks now in his visor. And again, they have a sun visor because of that glare that you might experience during half an orbit. In his sun visor, you see the reflection of the orbiter. And there's our overhead windows. All right, so you can see all the wiring. So they had to go outside and connect up all the wiring, actually put handrails on. That's how they traverse around the space station even today. Now you'll notice right here on his suit, he's got a tether. Because if he were to become detached from the spacecraft, he's now his own satellite traveling at Mach 25. And he's only got at the most, at the absolute most, eight hours of consumable. Then he's out of air and everything else, right? And so uh, have we lost tools up there? Unfortunately, yes. Did we lose tools on this mission? Unfortunately, yes. We won't talk about how many. Uh, but it, it can happen. Um, and, uh, but luckily, we've never had anybody become detached. But if they did, that's what this backpack is for. So this is called the Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. And in this backpack, if you were to become detached, you can deploy a little hand controller. It's got cold gas in there, and you don't have a lot of propellant, but you got enough propellant, hopefully, to stop you from tumbling and to fly you back to the spacecraft. Because with the station attached, we couldn't chase them with the shuttle. Back before space station, if the shuttle was out flying by itself, we could literally fly the shuttle back to the guy. Space station, you can't do that. So to this day, they still wear the safer backpacks. Uh, and that's exactly what they're there for. And again, because if you become detached, it probably means you imparted so much force that you broke your tether, which definitely means you're tumbling. So you have to stop your tumbling, figure out where you are, literally in the universe, where the spacecraft is, and how I'm going to fly back. And so they also train for that in virtual reality. So it was pretty interesting once everything was completed. And now it was time to go inside. So this is inside the US node. This is the our commander, Bob Cabana, he's still today the director of the Kennedy Space Center. This is Sergei Krikalov, our Russian cosmonaut. And so we'd never talked about who gets to go in first. We figured it was the boss. Uh, also, he was the chief of the astronaut office. That's how he got assigned to the flight. Uh, he assigned himself. Uh, how I got assigned to the flight is still a mystery, but I'm just thankful I was. Um, so unbeknownst to us, he didn't tell anybody, including Sergei, he decided that they would go in side by side because this was a joint American-Russian venture. So this is us in the U.S. node, and I'll tell you, wow, was the spacious compared to the space shuttle. Uh, bright, spacious, built for living in, in, for extended duration. Now you see signs, like that says two cup, that's a cupola. This one says to the lab, and you think. You, you guys really need directions of how to go from one room of your house to another. But I will tell you, just in these elements, if you're working upside down and in a corner, remember, there's no sensation of up or down or left or right. So you got to pull your head up and kind of look around, where am I? You have no neurovestibular sensation that you're upside down. And so in an emergency, it's important if we have to secure a module to know what module you're in and how to get to the next one. Also, that's why they're color-coded. The node had this wonderful salmon color. I, I didn't bother me at all. Uh, but the guys, especially two Marines on our crew, were not really, worried, not really thrilled about flying in a pink module. Um, and they kept making comments about it. You know, couldn't you guys have painted this any other color other than pink? It's actually salmon. But, uh, so the reason for it was is they had done human factor studies of what is an inviting and a relaxing color scheme. And, and it turned out those guys raved about it when they got back. They thought it was a, the best thing ever. All right, now on the other hand, this is inside the Russian module. You notice a, a drastic difference. Now, in this module,
in the US module, you can't really tell up from down based on anything other than signs on a wall. In the Russian module, you can immediately. You'll never get kind of confused about where you are because they only light the relative ceiling. The other thing they do, Velcro is an astronaut's best friend. I mean, our pants, everything's covered with it because literally you let your pen go, especially in the space station, you may never see it again, right, if it floats off. Um, we're very protective of our utensils. You only need one. It's a spoon, by the way, and uh, you lose your spoon. That's, that's like a drastic situation. So uh, everything that you can put Velcro on, you like to. We, for uh, fire protection reasons, we only allow a certain number of patches spaced so far apart. But in the Russian element, it's just lined with Velcro, top to bottom. And so we kind of like that. Also notice they have these bungees, so you can do the Superman thing as you go through the module. You just kind of push off and then do the Superman fly. Uh, and so this was not meant uh, as a living quarters. This is more an equipment propulsion type of, of module. All right. I have to go to manual. All right, you never know where you're going to find a cosmonaut. Uh, Sergey was hiding out inside one of the components uh, there one day as we went by. And you might notice right here is a power tool. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a picture of me with two power tools looking like I've gun, guns a-blazing. So one of the things that Sergey and I had to do is remove over 400 non-captive bolts, washers, and nuts because we had these closeout panels that were there for ascent. A lot of vibration during ascent, so we had to have these panels on. You don't need them on orbit. There's no, you know, ex extreme vibration loads or anything like that. So they wanted to take the panels off for ease of just think, you know, every time you go into your cupboard, you got to get your tools out and take a panel off to get into your cupboard, right? You don't want that. People are living in the space station. So we took all these out. Now, Sergey and I were both using these power tools and spending hours and hours and hours removing these, these bolts, washers, and nuts. And I used an EVA bag. So our, we have a bag during EVA if we remove something and it's got bristles at the top and you push it down and then the bristles keep it from floating out. I thought that was a pretty good idea and the EVA guys let me use it inside. Sergey used a baggie and he tested the tensile strength of a baggie which I believe was 199 bolts but not 200. <laughs> because I heard him say, uh-oh. And I, I turned around, and I've never seen the sea of floating, you know, hardware in my life. And I immediately start to try to grab everything. And he's, he being the space veteran that he was, he says, we give it an hour, we check the filter. <laughs> he was brilliant, by the way. That's exactly what happened. All right. And then it was time to leave, unfortunately. They actually asked us if we wanted an extra day on orbit. We've done such a good job. They said, hey, you guys want an extra day on orbit? Probably now I would have said absolutely. But at the time, I remember we took a vote, and we decided we were working on our 12th consecutive miracle. And sooner or later, our luck was going to run out. And we said, we're good. We'll come home anytime. Um, so that's the way we left the space station on orbit up around 230 miles. So. I always get the question, you guys are really busy, every second of every day, every minute, you know, is trained and executed per plan, so what do you do for fun? You look out the window. So who knows where that is? Houston, Texas. Okay, you can see Galveston Bay, you can see I-45, if you look close you can see the inner loop. And so we look out the window because I, I have a saying on my wall in my office and sometimes my students come in to chat with me. I teach courses like in aerospace human factors, how to design equipment for, for astronauts. Um, and so I have a saying on my wall and it's what changes you is not flying in space, it's seeing the earth from space. Because you're traveling around the entire earth every 90 minutes and every once in a while you might get a glimpse of Houston. And it's not in your field of view for very long because you're going by so quickly. You're going five miles a second. And so you get this glimpse of Houston and suddenly you realize my entire world is encapsulated in this little tiny dot. My family, my friends, my work, everything. And that is the most humbling experience you will ever have in your entire life. How about this one? 
Florida, right? So pretty cool to be able to look back where you launched from and where you're going to land. Now, we were in a high inclination, 51.6 degrees, and so we had a pass one night. This was in December. High pressure system over the U.S. We started in Florida, and we flew right up the east coast of the United States, just the same path that we did during launch. And when we got to Boston, if you got in the very top corner of the window and you look back, you could see the entire outline of our country all the way to Florida lit up. It, it was just spectacular. Heart, no one has a picture of it because you couldn't fit a camera in that tiny little space. But it's visions like that, you know, those, those memories. Can anybody identify that one? No? Is it? Who said that? Tell them what it is. Galapagos Islands. Okay, Very distinct, right? We love to fly over that. Very distinct. It almost looks like a seahorse. Anybody know where this is? Yeah, Sinai Peninsula, Saudi Arabia over there, Mediterranean Red Sea. I took this. Uh, and... <laughs> Luckily, to get just the right orbital sunrise or sunset picture, you know, you get another chance in another 90 minutes. Uh, but they're very hard to take. And so because, especially sunrise, you're not quite sure where the sun's going to come up. And you're using this high-powered lens. And also, you know that thing about you should never kind of look at the sun with a telescope? You probably shouldn't look through it with an 800 millimeter lens with a 2x extender on it either, like I did, because the sun came up. There. I was like, ah! Um, but it's right at sunrise and sunset that you can really pick up, you know, how precious our planet is and and how fragile that atmospheric band is around this planet. And you get these incredible. It's even better on that screen than it is on that one. Better in person. Uh, but you get these reds, blues, pinks, greens. I mean, it's just, just absolutely stunning. So I just really decided early on in my astronaut career after seeing my first orbital sunrise, I would try to specialize in that. Probably one of the coolest things ever. The aurora. Just, just incredible. I mean, on one of my flights, on the Hubble flight, we actually couldn't fly high-speed film because our radiation exposure was higher up at that altitude, and they said the film would fog. And on that flight, I mean, it's almost like we were flying through these giant columns of blue-green lights. But that's why, now you know why. You got a minute. Are you going to read a book? No. <laughs> Watch a movie? <laughs> then it's time to come home, so you got to don that spacesuit again. You figure what? You know, how hard is that? Except you've grown. I grew two inches. And when you grow in space, because you don't have the force of gravity on you, when you grow in space, your tendons and ligaments are stressed too, and you lose a lot of flexibility. And this is a rear entry suit. So now you're getting in a suit that's now two inches smaller than probably what you should have, and you can't really bend that well. And I know on one of my flights, we had to wave off two days, and on the third landing day, it took about four of us to cram one of the crew members in there. So, you know, we just kind of bent him because we knew it was probably possible that we wouldn't hurt him too badly. Uh, we said, we wave off again. You're sleeping in your suit. I'm sorry. Um, so that's Jim Newman, one of my classmates. I was fortunate to fly two missions with Jim, this one and the subsequent one, my last mission and Jim's last mission on the Hubble repair. And then it's time for entry and landing. Of course, the orbiter is a 200,000 pound glider. There's no air breathing engines. So it's all about energy management. We do things like we wait till 300 feet above the Earth to lower that main landing gear because once you lower the gear, you're landing, right? All that drag. So this is just a glider. There's no go around capability. So how do we come down out of space and land on a runway? We fly an imaginary circle in the sky. And so Depending if we're very high energy, we might fly 360 degrees around and then line up with the runway. Or if we're very low energy, we might fly 90 degrees around and line up with So that helps us determine the trajectory and manage our energy appropriately. Now, we touched down at 200 and some knots. 
between 205 and 195. It's a lot of pressure on the tires and brakes, so we've added a drag chute along the way and uh, uh, to help slow us down. That runway is three miles long, um, so we got a bit of room. This is us after flight. Um, we're all pretty happy. We're also pretty tired, and that's Bob saying to me, gosh, we really did it. Um, one of my favorite pictures, because that, that really symbolizes the teamwork. Um, and this is the International Space Station today. Six crew members orbiting the Earth, living and working in space. And uh, hopefully for, for some time to come. Uh, truly an international venture. As I said, the astronaut corps is very international. We have astronauts from Canada, Europe, Japan, Russia, Switzerland, you name it. And, uh, and so I think that's going to be the history of human spaceflight as well, or the future as well as the history, is this international collaboration. And I think that's very appropriate as we expand our horizons and, 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 and try to uh, explore out into space. All right. So I figure there might be some questions. Um, I'm big on technology. So students always love when I say, you can actually pull out your phones now. <laughs> uh, but if you have any questions, uh, we'll take some in the room. But if you want to uh, do any on Slido, uh, you can actually vote if it's a question you also have or not. And you just go to slido.com. So what questions do you have? Oh, that young man's jumping up. How long? Yeah, like it's as big as a football field. And that's why, and sometimes, not all the time, sometimes the space station flies over College Station. Now, I live in College Station. Where do you live? Uh, Brian. You live in Brian. Well, you can go outside with your dad and watch the space station fly over. There will be no mistake that it's a space station. It's the brightest star in the night sky because it's so big, right? And it's going really fast. You're only going to see it sometimes for two or three minutes, at the longest maybe five minutes. So if you see a really bright star going really quickly, that's the space station. That was one of the most fun things I got to do is come home and probably within about two or three days after landing, take my daughter outside in my own backyard and point up there and watch the space station go over and tell her, yeah, I had a little bit of that. Yes, sir. What's uh, the largest number of crew that the station has assigned to support? So for right now, it is six. And it is six because our only access to space is the Soyuz. We never know when we might have to do an emergency deorbit. The Soyuz is only capable of carrying three people at a time. So uh, until we have other vehicles, uh, right now we're constrained to six. And at that point, there are two Soyuz vehicles attached. And so sometimes there's three, sometimes there's six. Uh, as we get into, of course, you're probably familiar with, our commercial partners are working on vehicles that will go to the space station. NASA is working on vehicles that will go beyond low Earth orbit. Yes? So when was the last time you got an astronaut to watch the space station? 2011. Well, a human-tended rocket, right? So the shuttle program was retired in July of 2011. Yes? Very good question. That's an excellent question. Yes. Yes, and then not so much. So the first, my first flight, and if you saw, we changed into our blue flight suits because those orange suits are really heavy. So we came off the vehicle. Doctors looked us over and changed into those lightweight flight suits and tennis shoes. Not our boots, not our flight boots, tennis shoes. And so came off my first flight. They had my stuff there. And picked up my shoes, and I said, very funny, bring me my sneakers. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, somebody filled these with lead, bring me my sneakers. And they're like, no, seriously, those are your sneakers. And I said, uh-oh. <laughs> um, so you do feel very heavy, but then within a couple hours, you feel like you're floating again, which is a little problematic, especially when you're a little sleep deprived. When you make up in the middle of the night, and you're so used to, if I want to just pick up this computer, I just do it with my fingertip and I just floated around. And so this is back when, you know, there weren't too many cell phones, there were regular house phones, 
phone went off, and I tried to float it over to me, and it crashed to the floor. And, um, the other thing, my daughter still remembers this. Uh, I walked around the house for like two days with my toothbrush in my hand because I couldn't find Velcro to put it on. <laughs> yes, sir. How fast was it going? 17,500 miles an hour, five miles a second. Do you know how fast your car goes? Maybe, yeah, <laughs> I'll be nice, uh, 50 or 60 miles an hour? <laughs> yes. The comp most complicated piece, it was, it was all pretty complicated. Um, a lot of it, well, <laughs> retrospectively, the hardware and software wasn't that complicated, but because it didn't have much capability, it had 256K of memory. It's nothing these days, right? But we never updated them because of all the testing into the reliability and safety of that, and they're, they're critical. So there were five main computers on the shuttle. Hardware-wise, they were all the same, but the fifth one had different software. And that way, if somebody had a bug in the code, it wasn't going to kill us, right? We had this other computer with other software, limited capability, but we could engage the backup flight software, and we had enough capability to get to orbit and safely get home. Very little functionality on orbit. Mission was essentially over at that point, but hopefully safe enough. So one of the things was the interaction between all the systems and being able to look at failure signatures and determine, is that a sensor failure? Is that the actual system failure? So that was my job as a flight engineer because I sat behind and between the pilot and commander. So I had better view of all the systems than they did. Each one of those had views. So the commander has the environmental control system, has a computer system. The pilot has the electrical system, the uh, auxiliary power unit and hydraulic system. The commander can't see what's going on on the right side because the guy's sitting in there and that giant pressure suit switches are to his right or, or in front of him. So, uh, so the flight engineer helps diagnose that. So I would always say, I think this is the failure. I think this is a procedure. Get at least one other person and give me a thumbs up, and, and then we'd start, start working. Yes? Good question. Uh, no. Um, in most cases, though, you did kind of go to the back of the line. <laughs> um, and the line got pretty long there for a while. Uh, so, uh, but there were constraints on things like they told you not to drive your car for 48 hours, told you not to run for a week. Because even during a relatively short shuttle mission, you lose bone mineral density. And so people ha were feeling pretty good, went out for a run within a few days and got stress fractures and things like that. But the neurovestibular system takes a while and it's very, you know, dependent on the individual. Uh, about 70 to 80 percent of all astronauts get sick going into space. I was, and actually that number is a lot higher, at least if I can look at my crews and what happened. And I'm not saying this to brag, but I, I never got sick in space. But I sure got sick when I came home. I was the one, everybody's partying, everybody's out with their family and walking down the beach, and I'm laying in some facility with an IV dripping into me. And, and I, I guess I left it all in the orbiter or something, I don't know. But it was all nerve vestibular. Now, I was a flight engineer, so we had to shut down the vehicle. So I'm looking up, looking down, and I was making a lot of head motions. So that may have had something to do with it. Yes? Oh, very good question. So sleeping is one of the hardest things to do in space because when you close your eyes at night, you don't feel physically any differently. So what I tried to do is make myself feel like I did here on Earth. In my first flight, I went about five or six days trying to figure out methods, and none of them were working. One of, my, one of my office mates had recommended, just sleep free-floating. Just, you know, close your eyes. So I did that. And to this day, I don't know. Maybe someday they'll come, come clean and tell me. I've got my own suspicions. But on that mission, we had a pressurized tunnel. We had a habitation module where we were doing all these experiments. Well, I went to sleep in the shuttle, and I woke up in the habitation module. Now, I think I had some assistance down that tunnel and in, but they claim it was just simply airflow. But I decided I do not like to go to sleep and wake up in different rooms. So, uh, so what I did was I took bungees, finally figured this out, and I bungeed myself to the wall as tight as I could so that I could feel something behind me. 
Now, we have sleeping bags, but they don't have arms in them. So when you wake up in the middle of the night, you know, it looks like you're in the land of zombies. There's body parts floating everywhere. There's a pillow, but you've got to Velcro your head to it. So everybody looks a little funky. You wear blinders. We put blinders in the window because, obviously, the lighting's constantly changing. It's hard, you know, it's just like your mom would come in and open up the blinds or put a giant spotlight on you every 45 minutes. You know, probably disturb your sleep. So we do things like that. Yes, sir. Immediately, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I also, probably by virtue of flying thousand hours, uh, thousands of hours with night vision goggles, had some neck problems. And the neurosurgeon had told me, see me now, see me later, but you're not going to escape having, ultimately having surgery. I couldn't do that because I was flying ejection seat jets at the time. And I would have been grounded for a year. But in space, spinal elongates took all that pressure off. I felt great, but boy, did I feel bad when I got back because it was like in the ultimate traction in space. It was interesting talking to this medical doctor. He said, does anything take away the pain in your neck? I said, yeah. He said, what? I said, go into space. And he goes, we should write about that. <laughs> yes. So that's, those are excellent questions. So it is a true partnership. It initially, the two major partners, obviously, are the US and Russia. But every country or entity that wanted to be a part of this had to provide some capability. So for example, the Canadian Space Agency provided all the robotic systems. And in return for providing all the robotic systems, they get one Canadian astronaut every seven years on the station. And so your contribution is hand in hand with how much utilization can you get out of it. In terms of the language, there is the USOS, which is US operating station, and then the Russian element. So even though they're all together, Russia is the language in the Russian element, and English in the, in the US, which includes the European module, the Japanese module. So, Everybody is trained on both English and Russian, including I have a friend who's a Japanese astronaut, and he was going through Russian language training with me. And he finally, so he's in this class in America, you know, Japanese is his late native language, and he's learning, you know, English to Russian translation. He finally said, I got to cut out the middleman and go right from Japanese to Russian. Uh, so it's even more challenging for some non native American speakers. Yes. Training. Training, training, and more training. My, my family would tell you that about six months out of a mission, I was so focused that physically I was in our house, but mentally 100% on the mission. And that's just the way I'm geared. I, I get super focused. I even warn my students if I'm working in my office, you know, I'm, they'll, they'll knock and they'll say, do you have a minute? And I always tell them, give me about 10 or 20 seconds to come out of my focus mode. <laughs> and then I'll, because otherwise I'm going to look up at you like, nah, I really don't have a lot of time right now. Um, but it's, it's all the training and preparation. So we train exclusively to do those tasks, you know, for, for many, many hours. The EVAs, for every hour in space of doing a spacewalk, they probably trained around 15 hours in the pool. Yes, sir. No, it was. It was. We, uh, when I first started out in my astronaut career, we had the, the old wet F facility. But yes, the Sunny Carter facility was built specifically for getting ready for all the EVAs that we're going to have to do to assemble the space station. Yes, young man. My favorite thing? Looking back at the Earth. One time I got to talk to my daughter on my first flight. She was only six years old, and I was a single mom. And so I was talking to her, and I had a video camera. I turned the video camera out the window, and then I turned it back on me. And she said, Mom, Mom, can, can you point that camera back out the window again? <laughs> I can see you anytime. Um, so that, that's probably the most. Uh, let's see. Yes, sir. 
it's, it's, it is a real concern. The, uh, it is growing all the time, so both in low Earth orbit as well as beyond. And so, uh, you know, for a long time what's happened is when a spacecraft has reached its intended life, a lot of people just boost it to a higher orbit. Yes, that extends its life, but sooner or later it's going to come down. Uh, so space is getting a little bit crowded, and the problem is this. Nobody owns space. And it's going to be very costly. There, there are groups looking at how do you go clean this stuff up. You, know, you can't explode it because now you just fragment it. Now you've made the problem orders of magnitude worse. And so people are looking at how to clean it up, but it's going to become a, more, a bigger and bigger issue as time goes on. Because any size, even a minuscule size piece of debris at those speeds could be catastrophic to a spacecraft, especially windows on a spacecraft, anything like that. Uh, way in the back. Um, maybe immediately. So that's one of the things that would make sure that if we landed and we had smoke in the cockpit or we had some kind of electric fire or something, we would have to get ourselves out and you never leave without your buddy. So part of our training was physical training. You know, we, we considered that a part of our job. Going to the gym was a part of our job and staying in good shape was a part of our job because just because, you know, you were degraded, um, you still had to be able to self-rescue as well as potentially rescue your, your, your buddy. Yes? Very good, yeah. Um, yeah, we can fly, we can't fly much, as you might suspect. Um, but uh, on all my missions, I took three things. I took an American flag, I took a Bible, pretty small one, because I couldn't take a big one, uh, a Bible, uh, and I took a banner from the Ohio State University, because I am a Buckeye. <laughs> and in fact, uh, after my first flight, the president of the university called me up and said, please, you know, we'd like you to present this banner back. I presented it, and then I said, ask him in this big audience, can I have it back? I want to fly it on all my missions. So it was really special to me. It flew on all my missions. Uh, let's see. How are we doing on time? Up, oh, I think we're uh, one question away. We'll go right in the middle. So my first flight, we deployed a tracking and data relay communication satellite and did a whole bunch of biomedical experiments. Uh, we also did a spacewalk testing out some of the techniques for the Hubble repair. Um, I'm sorry, my second mission was the, the, the Tracking Data Relay Satellite. The first mission, we retrieved the satellite, the European Carrier Assembly. Third mission, Space Station Assembly. Fourth mission, Hubble. So shuttle was very versatile. We could deploy spacecraft. We could retrieve spacecraft. Obviously, the only way in which we built the International Space Station was taking it element by element, you know, like a giant Lego set, you know, several hundred miles up and putting it together piece by piece. Well, I, I really appreciate you guys coming today. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, presentation and hope you're enjoying the Physics Festival. Thank you so much, and uh, hopefully see you some here. <laughs>